My name's Will Harvey. I'm a Professor of Management and Associate Dean at the University of Exeter Business School, which is based in the beautiful county of Devon in the southwest of the UK. Hi everyone, I'm Alice. Um, I'm the International Officer uh, for the University of Exeter. I cover the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and I will make my email address available if you have questions going forwards. Um, I'm really happy to help you with those. Real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Katie and the team, for inviting me from the University of Exeter. I'm going to talk, as you can see from the title today, about learning from experience. What white collar crime and sustainability teach us about leadership. And I guess the essence of this talk really is to give you kind of a flavor and your family's a flavor of what a sort of a mini lecture might look like if you came to Exeter. And please, as we've said already, if you've got any questions, just add them in the Q&A. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about leadership and reputation, which I think are two incredibly important topics, whether we're talking in a political domain, in a business domain, whether we're talking uh, about communities and charities, it's a very, very relevant topic. Uh, and that's gonna segue into me discussing, well, why should we care about this? What, who, who's interested in this and why should we be interested in this? And I'm going to finish uh, my talk by giving uh, you two examples, one from uh, on sustainability, on uh, the mining company Rio Tinto uh, and their operations in Madagascar, where I went to conduct some research. And the second example is based on some research I've done with my PhD student on white collar criminals. So I guess the first thing when we think about leadership and reputation is to ask, well, what, what are these concepts? What, what do we mean by them? And I think the first point I would make is that they're what's known as intangible, which means you can't physically see reputation or leadership but it's, it's intangible, so, it, so it's just somewhat invisible. But of course, our actions as individuals, our actions as an organization have big impacts on what people think about us and who we work for. When things are going badly, it's known as a liability, okay? So that means that it can really cause significant damage. And in extreme cases, it can lead to people being fired or it can lead to the collapse of a business, you know, uh, the collapse of a government, for example. So that's why it's important when we think about leadership and reputation to think about the positive and negative aspects of both those concepts. Now, there are lots of examples of people that have experienced scandals, and, and that often goes from maybe having a positive reputation to something very negative. But they tend to actually, even though we read a lot about them and hear stories, they tend to be the exception rather than the norm. Once you have a reputation for something, it often means you can start building your reputation into something else. So Amazon, I think, is a brilliant example of that. If you think, you know, 20 years ago, their start, what they started out with, which was basically just selling books online, and you look at what they offer now, you know, all kinds of products and services, you know, from Amazon Prime video content to Audible, where you can you know, listen to and download all kinds of audio content. They're really diversifying enormously. And that's because they, they keep sort of building their reputation in different areas and growing and growing and growing. And that's a great advantage when you've got a reputation. It allows you to enter more easily into new related markets. I'm going to talk through real examples that I have been doing research on because no one is better at telling a story of an organization than someone that's actually either worked for that organization uh, or has researched it from an independent perspective. So this example, as I alluded to at the beginning, is about a mining company called Rio Tinto um, and its operations in Madagascar, which, as you can see from the bottom right of the diagram, is just off the tip of the southern part of the continent of Africa. Um, so in the 1980s, Rio Tinto started exploring Madagascar uh, for various different types of minerals. And there was a town in the southern tip known as Fort Dauphin in the Anosi region where ore deposits were identified. Um, now this is really interesting because the particular mineral that was identified is one called ilmenite, which I'll show you a photo of in a minute which is a sort of a jet black, very pure mineral that's used for a lot of products that we use uh, in the world. Ironically, um, many of them white, so toothpaste is a, a, a very important product that Ilmenite uh, helps to produce in many cases, paints, 
uh, different types of uh, colorations of plastics, for instance. But what we've got here is a really extreme example of a mineral that is in very high demand around the world. And you've got a country which is one of the poorest in the world and has one of the richest biodiversity um, hotspots. And so that kind of combination, I think, makes a really interesting challenge for leaders in terms of reputation management. Just giving you some ideas of the challenges. So on the top left here, you've got you know, primary rainforests. And we all know, of course, the huge challenges the world faces in terms of climate change and in terms of biodiversity depletion. And so, again, you can imagine this challenge where you've got a mining company that's producing something that a lot of us are using in our daily consumption. And then you've got planetary issues of this kind. And then the bottom right, you can see um, uh, the lemur, which is uh, an indigenous uh, mammal, uh, to Madagascar, and there are many different species uh, available. And not surprisingly, this is a quotation from a global NGO called Friends of the Earth. You can see this quotation is very damning of the project. Destroying these unique forests for the sake of a quick profit is madness. The international community should mobilize resources for developments that will help and not wreck the local economy, irreplaceable wildlife. And so there are lots of these types of newspaper reports, uh, criticisms from global uh, NGOs, rightly so as well, because we've only got one planet. And uh, in many cases, once you deplete a resource, it can take centuries, if not millennia, to, to recoup that. Let's then for the last 10 minutes talk about the second case study, which is an ultimate example of losing reputation and particularly leaders losing reputation. So there are lots of high profile leaders who for various reasons have lost their reputation. And I've given some examples in the photographs from Martha Stewart in the US to Kweki Edaboli, uh, in the UK and to the, pre, the, the former chief executive of Enron, which is one of the largest corporate scandals in the world, uh, Jeff Skilling uh, at the bottom of the photograph. So the question I'm asking is what can we learn from people like these individuals when they reflect in prison on their past actions? So the question that I'm going to focus on from some research, and again, a question for you to think about, um, in terms of what your answer to this would be is, well, why do individuals commit professional misconduct? What causes some of us to do that and not others, for instance? Let me very briefly tell you what I did with this study. So this was done with one of my PhD students and we interviewed 70 inmates in a United States of America federal prison. And they came from all walks of life in terms of their careers. They were chief executives, they worked in investment banking, they were doctors, they were government officials, they worked in real estate, they were accountants, they worked in technology, every kind of sector. So I think this is a very, very interesting context in which to understand white collar crime. So let me just talk you through some of the things that we found. This table, um, and the table, as you can imagine, if you've got 70 interviewees is, is huge. So I, I obviously couldn't uh, show it all on one slide here, but I just selected three different people here. And of course I can't mention their names because that would be uh, breaching a kind of an ethical code of conduct. Um, but what we've done is sort of identified, given them a, a code number, and then you, you can see on here their education, their age, what kind of profession they were in, the size of their organization, their prominence, i.e. were they very well known in, in public, uh, the type of fraud, and at the time of the field work, how long had it been since the event that caused them to go to prison? You'll note that I very much focus on the individual level here, and one of the major take homes that we found from our research is actually there's three levels of analysis going on, and I've mentioned two of them in number three. There's the individual, there's the organization and the culture and the expectations within that uh, organization. And then it's the environment, the wider environment in which we operate. Maybe it's our family context. Maybe it's the degree of regulation of a business. And those three things, the individual, the organization and the environment working in tandem together, give us a very strong sense of why people commit professional misconduct.
I would say uh, it applies to all types of organizations. Um, and what I mean by that is that every organization has a unique set of stakeholders. Now, a stakeholder could be an employee, it could be an investor, it could be um, uh, your former employees, it could be a government, it could be a regulator. And the point is, is that you know, each organization has a different set of stakeholders. And so it definitely applies to different types of organizations, whether it's government, private, startup, family business. Who are those stakeholders and how do they perceive and how do they influence your organization? So once you've identified who they are and how they influence, then you've got to think, well, what's our strategy to engage with them to help ensure that they perceive the organization in the right way? It's not just about wider trends that are shifting, but also uh, re recognizing that uh, different stakeholders can can influence that agenda in different ways. So, uh, and so one of the reasons, by the way, that I think Rio Tinto, and I, by the way, I'm not trying to sort of say that Rio Tinto was brilliant at what they did, but I think that they did some things well. There was certainly lots of criticism, also. But I think one of the benefits, and this is rather sad that it's come to this, but one of the benefits that Rio Tinto has gained is a lot of mining and energy companies in other parts of the continent of Africa, having done things very badly historically. You know, there's some horrific examples, you know, across the continent of Africa. So yeah, absolutely. And of course, as we know, climate change has become much more central, but I think that the, the one that gets talked about less that is arguably even more important is biodiversity. And of course, biodiversity links into climate change. But the thing about biodiversity that's different from climate change is that there is some degree of reversibility with climate change in terms of carbon. But with biodiversity, once you've lost the species, you know, you can't just regain a species again. And so the stakes are arguably even higher there. And, and that needs to, in my view, get on the, gen the agenda quicker. Oh, lots. Yeah. And this is, I think, makes the project fascinating is that the PhD student who I was working with, Navdeep Aurora, um, he's my, he was my PhD student, he is, we're still working on the project. He was an inmate. So he was one of the inmates, not one of the 70, because you know he was conducting the interviews. I would say one of the, the, the things that was interesting is how many of these people had very difficult personal circumstances. Alcohol addiction, drug addiction, uh, children who had committed suicide, divorces, family bereavements, the list sort of goes on. That doesn't mean, by the way, that because you've had, you know, a very difficult personal life that you're going to commit a crime, but it might help to explain why in a given context, you might be more likely to take some risk or be more likely to overlook some kind of ethical procedure. So that I think was a very interesting insight. Uh, Navdeep and I are both giving a talk in a few weeks time um, to the Crown Prosecution Service in the UK actually um, and hopefully I mean who knows where that will go but one thing I'd be really interested in doing is to do a UK study as well you know you often think you come out of prison and it's like you know thank goodness you know you're out of the situation and and having you know visited the prison several times myself you know I can't blame people for thinking that but actually what you realize is the stigma and the baggage that a lot of these people carry with them many, many years afterwards. We make it very difficult for people to rehabilitate. Whereas there are other countries, particularly some of the Scandinavian countries actually, are much more progressive. Great question. And I should have uh, made that clear in um, the project that the, the prison was an all male prison. So the, 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 the gender distribution is completely skewed towards all male. But if you look at um, uh, macro statistics, uh, there's a very strong bias towards male um, uh, people committing white collar crimes. And that's one of the reasons, by the way, that there has been a, a, a big emphasis 
impact on um, diversity on boards and diversity on leadership teams. Again, not just because morally that's the right thing to do, um, but also because there's lots of evidence that better decisions are made when you have a diverse set of groups. Now, gender, of course, is just one social characteristic. We could start talking about age, ethnicity, religion, all kinds of other social characteristics. Now, of course, when you have highly socially diverse groups, that can sometimes be difficult to manage. It requires good management and leadership because if you get lots of different perspectives, you know, it can cause conflict. But if you manage it well, you also get better decisions. And, and that would be, if I was to say, you know, one final point take home from this is that one way to think about how you can avoid unethical behavior is trying to create structures where you have less individuals making important decisions a more kind of team group type of decision making, because through that discussion, you tend, particularly if you've got diverse groups, you tend to kind of weed out some of those unethical practices. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for answering all those questions. Um, it's definitely added an extra layer of interest um, with those questions that have been sent through. So thank you so much to the people that asked those. Um, Alice, I did notice that you answered a couple there as well um, on the chat. So if you do have any questions specific to studying at the University of Exeter, please feel free to reach out to Ed Boy um, and we'll be able to help you and put you in touch with the University of Exeter as well. But let me just take this chance and opportunity to say thank you so much to um, Professor Will um, for doing this lecture for us. I found it very interesting and I'm sure everybody else has found it too. And um, we will be making a recording of the video live as well. So those um, people that registered and unfortunately weren't able to attend today, we will be making sure that they have that available to them. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for your time and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, everyone.